For as long as man has expressed himself with music, art, theater, and dance, people have gathered to share and enjoy them. Throughout the ages, each generation has produced artists, musicians, and dancers who not only entertain and enrich the lives of a particular generation, they also add to the rich legacy of the arts that endures forever. As man became more civilized, so did his gathering places. From the walls of caves to art galleries, and from a circle of people around the fire to our great concert halls and theaters. Historically, only a small percentage of the people have patronized the arts. Because of this, the arts polarized in the larger cities that could afford to build cultural centers. For years, the people in the small cities have had to travel to Philadelphia, Chicago, or New York City for the arts. This is the story of a remarkable woman and the people of a small city in Florida who dreamed of having their own center for the arts and became an exception to the belief that culture and the arts are found only in the large cities. It's the evening of the inaugural gala, the opening of the center. Final preparations have been made. It seems like a long time since the first visions of the dream began six years ago. Six years of dedication, perseverance, and combined human effort have brought them to this moment. There is a sense of anticipation in the air. Something wonderful has happened. We are going to be entertained for the rest of our lives. The ribbon is cut. They have accomplished something cities many times their size haven't. The doors open and they enter, knowing the quality of their lives and the lives of their children will be better for as long as they live here. Good evening and welcome to the Philharmonic Center for the Arts. As they enter the auditorium to take their seats, they know this is a very special evening. Something special has happened. And it's not because of just a person. It's a right idea at the right time in the right place. And 7,400 people helped make it possible. Yes, something very special has happened. We'll come back to this glorious evening, but now let's go back and see where and how this all began. This is Naples, Florida. 
Naples and its neighbor, Marco Island, lie on the Gulf of Mexico in southwest Florida. It has been an exclusive retirement area for many years. There is a quiet reserve about it, and yet it's a warm and friendly place. Bordering on one of the most important ecological areas of the world, it has diverse and abundant wildlife and perpetual green growth. It is a beautiful place. This is Myra Janko Daniels. She moved here in 1978 after a successful career in the advertising business. She had no way of knowing what the future held for her that fateful evening. She went with a friend to a concert of local musicians who had formed a small symphony orchestra. A group of Marco Island and Naples musicians got together and were playing a concert in the United Church on Marco Island. And uh, I had given them a small donation and they invited me to come. I invited in turn my good friend Mary Ellen Hawkins. It wasn't so bad. In fact, we thought it was pretty good. So after the performance, we went up to the uh, president of the organization and he looked long-faced and he said, but we owe so much that we can't pay the musicians. Mary Ellen said, Myra will help you. So I said, well, you know, Myra, you have the time to do this. Uh, many of the rest of us who might be interested don't, and you have the expertise, so you, you do this, and uh, I offered her services. So <laughs> that's how it all started. Next day they came to the house, and uh, we worked out a direct marketing uh, concept, and from then we were off and running. I felt that they had to have at least $100,000. And we did achieve that within, uh, oh, a handful of days. I can't tell you, uh, well, maybe a week, 10 days. Our first telephone call was one I made to a name I didn't know. And the call was to a friendly voice who gave us the time to hear our story. After not revealing any of her thoughts, I asked her what part of the world she was from. She said, Philadelphia, and I remarked that my mother used to braid my hair and take me to the Philadelphia Orchestra. He said, my father was one of the larger benefactors to that grand orchestra. I asked who her father was. And she said, J. Howard Pugh. And as you know, the Pugh Foundations of Charitable Trusts for the Arts are very well known. And I picked myself up off the floor said I'd like to meet her to the next day. She said she had given all her money away, but she would give us 25. I thought $25, it turned out to be $25,000. I didn't do nearly as well on my second call. Well, that's how I got acquainted with Frances Pugh Hayes, who was our first large benefactor. Franny, of course, has given millions to us to help build this project and the orchestra. I have a very strong feeling that when you live in a community, you do as much for that community as you possibly can. This same woman had the foresight to say, you cannot play in school auditoriums or in churches. You should start right now looking for land and build a fine concert hall. That was her concept at that time. She did offer $2 million for it. So I said, Myra, I'm not interested unless we get some kind of a hall because schools are not the place to have good music. We've played in churches, we've played in high schools, and what an auditorium really does is put the final piece uh, to the puzzle. You've got an audience, you have great music, you have wonderful musicians, but you put it in a wonderful setting and everything pulls uh, to the next highest level. We found that the land was around $2 million plus. Uh, I suggested that she put her money in escrow and that we look for donated land, and that we did. And Westinghouse Communities of Naples were very, very generous in 
allowing us to have prime land in their beautiful Pelican Bay development. Here, we're especially interested in the performing arts, um, and that's a reflection of the community. And that's what this corporation is, a reflection of the community in which we do business. We think it was the smart thing to do, the right thing to do, the right place at the right time, and um, we would not be at all surprised if other people will follow suit. We started our surveys. We did our feasibility studies. And the state of Florida gave us a grant to do just that. The principal motivating factor to me was uh, the economic advantage that such a facility is to not only the local community, but the state as a whole. We came together and we started surveying what we thought were some of the better centers uh, throughout the country. We went to the Wortham Hall in Houston. We went to the Davies Hall in San Francisco and others that Myra and some of the other members of her building committee visited uh, gave us a great deal of input. As the research continued, the concept evolved. Any community wanting to build a center for the arts should write their mission. They should know where they're going and write it. The concept here in Naples, Florida, was a concept that would incorporate all of the arts because we had no other facilities. Visions of the dream became clearer. Funding efforts were accelerated. Just as we used to take a uh, package goods to market when I was in the advertising business, this is a product and it had to be taken to its market. We started, of course, with the orchestra because the orchestra is the hub of the performing arts. And we used uh, television, some radio, a great deal of newspaper to promote the products on stage. To secure the funds for this building, everything had a price tag. We priced the seats, we priced the mirrors, we priced the carpet, we priced the bricks, we priced the windows, we priced the lights, and everyone had a chance to become a part of this project. I'll never forget the little boy who bought a brick. He didn't have a hundred dollars. That's what bricks were selling for. So I asked him how much he had. He said, a dollar twenty-nine. I left him a dime. But that young man as a brick in our complex. The majority of our funds came from individuals and from the state. Uh, and actually corporations, a few corporations, uh, quite a few in Naples, uh, gave proportionally in their ability to do so. As we begin to look at the economy in the 90s and what responsibilities companies will be, I think you must see more social responsibility on the part of corporations. Many industries are being dragged into it sometimes, but the enlightened corporation, the, the, the company that's, that's driven for things that are a little bit possibly more universal and long term, require that they become much more community oriented and driven in that regard. Getting involved with the arts is something that is very rewarding, but it's also a very, very smart responsibility, and, and there's nothing but win, win, win when you get involved. I perceive, and we do at the state level, that uh, there will be a great deal of benefit to the state and that, that the investment the state has made in uh, providing money for this facility and others around the state that um, will come back to us many fold. We've stopped at nothing to raise money. We allowed children to give their spending money. We have taken money out of Social Security checks. We've produced cookbooks, style shows, auctions on stage. 
trips abroad. And this has brought everyone who has given into our family. We are a family. And the people who come here feel that way. It brought the community together in, a, in, a, in an almost a magical way. Private citizens, civic organizations, business organizations, the governmental organizations all came together and, and worked very hard to make that happen. And I think you had to be there the opening night to realize how that magic had taken place. And I think that there's a thing about the Philharmonic that probably has done more to create a sense of community in this town than anything else in the past. We're terribly grateful to this community for all it has done. And I'm particularly pleased to be standing here in front of the donors wall where our major contributors are named. When people understand that you are a 501c3 not-for-profit and that you are giving earnest effort toward this project, then you will find amazing things happen. Doors open that you've never dreamt of. People come to you because they believe, too, in a better way for, of life. As funding continued, the team was assembled to design and build the Dream Center. Eugene Aubrey was chosen as the architect to design the center. Robert Forsyth would work closely with him. Robert Tanner would be the acoustician. Engineers, contractors, and theater consultants were assembled. The team came together and construction began. Work continued on the building for almost two years. The dedication, time, money, and effort would soon be rewarded. Then finally, it was complete. Their home for music, art, theater, and dance a modern-day castle. A place of dreams. As you go through the door, you enter the grand lobby. And from there, the glistening Verdi marble floors will take you through a total experience. You can go to all four art galleries. You can walk through the sculpture garden. You can go to the Black Box Theater. Or you can take a music lesson. And then you can go to the main auditorium. The auditorium is like a musical instrument, acoustically designed and tuned. Acoustics is both an art and a science. And it's obviously of great importance in a building like this. The most important thing is, of course, to have clarity of hearing of whatever is going on on the stage. But at the same time, particularly with music, you, you need a little reverberation, a little warmth, which the building will supply. And in addition, from the acoustical point of view, speech requires rather shorter reverberation times than music. And so one of the things we have done is to have drapes which fall down over the barrels on the rear wall of the theater. And they can be lowered for speech performances or raised for music. And this is one way of lowering the reverberation time to get good clarity of speech. It's also very important to have a quiet hall. 
I have been in halls where every performance is a concerto for orchestra and air conditioning equipment. The hall itself is virtually a box within a box. It's on a separate slab and all the walls are double between it and the surrounding world. This is a very, very flexible theater. We've had everything from Dorothy Hamill's Broadway on Ice to Sir Neville Mariner's Academy of St. Martin in the Fields. We use a very flexible acoustical orchestra shell on the stage, which can be big so that we can take an orchestra of a hundred and a chorus, or it can be made small as it is for soloists, but in whatever configuration it is, it virtually finishes off the hall as a concert hall. Now for theatrical performances or ballet, that is removed completely and the theater becomes a theater with a stage house with all the scenic facilities that you can want. This building is equally as important as a city hall, as a courthouse, in the, as a central library. It is a gathering place for people. As we return now to the inaugural gala, the very first gathering, the performance is ending. out of the auditorium into the sculpture garden. As they step out into the tropical evening, we wonder what their reactions will be to this festive evening and their place of dreams. It's wonderful. As to the reaction, well, breathtaking. It's the most beautiful thing that I've ever seen. The hall is definitely wonderful. We are just thrilled with what this uh, theater is like for us to dance in. First of all, the stage is wide and deep. It's beautifully equipped. Uh, the acoustics are sensational. Uh, the orchestra is wonderful. So we're thrilled not only at the hall, but the way it's run. And that's a very, very important factor for any visiting organization. We feel no longer that we visit. We feel that we indeed live here. We are residents. I think the night we opened was a very spiritual night. Um, if you were in the audience, you could feel the electricity. And there was that almost like we did it because 8,000 people had a dream and they were able to witness that dream come true. Yes. The dream has been fulfilled.
The Naples Philharmonic Orchestra's key signature is excellence as it tunes up for this next season. Artistry, ensemble, repertoire, all stand at their highest levels. You are the key to sustaining the future of a resident professional orchestra at the Philharmonic Center for the Arts. Your appreciation of music may be expressed in an endowment to maintain the musical talent of this inspiring orchestra. A tax-deductible endowment will ensure our future, enable the orchestra to do more for children and for those of limited means, and provide the finest in programming for everyone. Learn more about the art of charitable giving and receiving. It will change your future and ours. Phone 597-1111.